Many of us are going through the book of Ecclesiastes together this, this year in our small group. And in Ecclesiastes 3, there's a curious set of verses, uh, verses that juxtapose one thing against the other and, and, and declare that there is a time for all things. And in Ecclesiastes 3, it says that there's a time for laughing. There's a time for rejoicing. There's a time for celebration. And that there's a time for mourning. And in this life, it's a curious thing given to us by God that at, at points, those times, they overlap. Those circles of joy and rejoicing and the circles of mourning and sorrow overlap with each other. And the thing that binds them, the bridge that for the Christian spans to both both of those grounds is what? What is the thing that reaches from joy and celebration and gladness and is there and very much present is the foundation of joy and celebration and gladness and also of Christian mourning, suffering, and sorrow? It's the peace of God. It's the peace of God that transcends and that spans and bridges the chasm. And so this morning, a congregation, I want to speak to you about the coming of the Prince of Peace. Jesus is our Prince of Peace. And I want to ask you this morning, what bearing does the Prince of Peace have on your life? How has the Prince of Peace changed you? How has he affected you? So would you stand with me? We're going to turn to the book of Isaiah. We're going to read Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. This is the word of God. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. The word of the Lord. Amen. Let's pray together. Great and mighty Lord, maker of heaven and earth, sustainer of our world and the whole entire universe, the one who elevates all world powers and rulers, the God who is also near to us, not just far above us, but with us, Emmanuel, the God who knows our hearts better than we even know them ourselves. We pray that you'd be praised and glorified. You are worthy of praise and adoration and love and affection. Be praised by our mouths. Be praised by our lives. And great is your faithfulness. Your loving kindness is everlasting, and so should our praise back to you be everlasting. As we gather to worship and to hear from you on this Christmas Eve, we think back to your first coming, and it seems a long time to us. And though that we know we're in the last days, looking ahead often can seem distant when we think about your return. But through all of our lives, you have been faithful to us, and may we be faithful to you. And now would you reveal something of your perfect knowledge about us this morning, that we might be strengthened and encouraged and built up in love, and may we receive your peace. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please be seated. Jesus is the prince of peace. Isaiah prophesies, saying that one will come who is going to be called the prince of peace. And he follows up that title with a description describing the effect of the one who is to come. There will be no increase of his government, to the end of his government, rather, or of peace. This isn't just a poetic description. This isn't simply nice sentiment. It's not potential. It's actual. It's not hypothetical. The fact that Jesus is the Prince of Peace is as real and as true and as in me- should be as meaningful to you 
as a Christian, as the very ground that you stand upon. This isn't just alliteration made for some hallmark sentiment over the holidays. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Jesus wants you to be at peace, to live in peace, to sleep in his peace. And yet there are many things that cause us, both large and small, to be restless, to cause us to be fearful, anxious. Recently, last weekend, we were hosting a Christmas celebration for my wife's extended family. And as we were making preparations, Aaliyah mentioned to me that somebody was going to be coming uh, somebody who's dating somebody in the family, extended family, and that, you know, he was, a, he was a doctor who lived outside of New York City. And she just told me a few, I, Aaliyah just mentioned a few things about him. Yeah, he's a doctor, he's dating this girl, they've, they've I, I don't know much about him, but I've seen they're going all over the world, they keep traveling all over the world. So I have a, just a few facts. And I'm out in my yard preparing for the Christmas celebration, and I start thinking about what she had said, and I start thinking, wow, if, if any of you have seen my house, you know that it's pretty muddy, and it's kind of a construction zone. I start thinking, oh, this guy who keeps posting these pics online of being, you know, in front of Taj Mahal and all this, these different places, I think, what's he going to think of coming here to celebrate? You know, it didn't consume too much time, but it was sort of on my mind as I thought about this guy who I didn't know coming in and, and, and probably judging me, you know, and my family for the state of our house come this Christmas season. Well, listen. It took me all of two minutes to realize that every little bit of worry I might have had in my stomach going into Christmas Day with this guy was unfounded, completely unfounded. He's, he's, he's from um, Palestine. He's a Muslim. His father, he, he travels a lot because he goes back to Palestine to see his family. His whole mom's side still lives there. His father was sort of an exiled out of the country years ago, and so they came to New York, and from there his father got a, a number of, of low-paying jobs to, to try and make it, and he told me that his dad had five children, and they were all raised in a tiny little apartment in New York City. And just recently, after his dad retired, he bought this little tiny house in the, out in the country, outside the city, that's a complete wreck, and he's doing the same thing that I am to my house. And I only share that to say that situation illustrated to me, as I was thinking about the peace of Christ, just how easily we forfeit what Christ has given us. Just how easily we let go of the peace that Jesus doesn't just say is hypothetical or is an option, but, a, but of the peace that he says that he is and that he gives to you and to me. We often feel paralyzed when making decisions We'll fear a decision, and then after we make a decision, a big one or a small one, how often do we, do we continue to fear, wondering if we've made the right one? Oh, what if it gone better if I would have done this or that? We have all sorts of devices and, at points, vices that we use to help bring a sense of peace to our hearts that are worried and upset, fearful, speculating about what others think or what might, I, might, what might others do. We use these devices to, to cope with our circumstance that seem to rob us of the peace that we want. Because we all want peace. Tomorrow is Christmas. And Christmas is when we celebrate the coming of the Prince of Peace. And I want to speak to you about the peace that he brings. And I want to tell you about the peace that he offers you. And I want you to consider what bearing the Prince of Peace has on your life. Do you live in the peace that he has brought? It seems unnatural to celebrate Christmas with hearts that are vexed and anxious, doesn't it? It seems very unnatural. And yet many will be. We recognize that it's unnatural, but for celebrating the, the Prince of Peace, we as Christians have to understand that though this reading is often read during Advent from Isaiah, the idea of Jesus' peace is not reserved for one day of the year. It is not reserved to be that little piece of spiritual tape that keeps everything together just over the holidays so that we can make it through. The peace of Jesus is the banner that you live under and that I live under. 
He's the banner of our lives. This week, we're pausing our series on the book of Acts. But for the last number of weeks, we've been talking about together the circumstances around the sending of the Holy Spirit. And in the Gospels, we are told that Jesus speaks about the sending of the Spirit a few times. One of those times is in John, and in John we've got a long discourse between Jesus and his disciples on that night in the upper room before he's betrayed, before he's betrayed by Judas, before he'll eventually be crucified. And in that moment, in that room, on that night, Jesus makes a promise to his disciples in connection with sending the Holy Spirit. And this is what he says. Peace I leave with you. He knows what's going to come. He knows that betrayal and death, persecution are very near. And at this time, in this moment, Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives to you do I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, nor be fearful. Think about what Jesus is saying. Jesus came as the Prince of Peace. He's nearing his time on earth, and he specifically tells his disciples that he is leaving his peace with them. He's giving it to them. Don't you want a life that is rooted in the peacefulness of Christ? Doesn't a life of peace sound wonderful? So many people seek for peace. They will spend gobs of money, time and attention and energy trying to achieve this one thing. But here it is, and Jesus is offering it free of charge to you. He says that he's given his peace and he will give his peace to all those that love him. And it's not just offered to his disciples. He says he's leaving it with them. He leaves it with those who love them. It's a past tense. It does sound wonderful. His name shall be called the Prince of Peace. And there will be no end to the increase of his government or of his peace. No end. Let's consider his life, though, to see what this great peace looks like. Shall we? You ever have a house project and, you know, somebody offers you help, but you've seen their house? You with me? Nobody in this room, I'm sure, but, you know, you're like, eh, no, 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 it's fine, I'll do it myself, you know? Okay, Jesus is the Prince of Peace, let's take a look. Jesus is born in a car. No, he's not born in a car. We have had children here born in a car, but it's sort of the analog to being born in a car on the way to the hospital. Joseph and Mary are traveling for a census. They're away from their home. The time came upon Mary, and she said, it's coming. They tried to make it into an inn, but no room was found in the inn. And so Jesus is born in a horse stall, and I I don't think he really minded being born in a horse stall. I'm sure his parents wished the circumstances would have been different. But it's not the most peaceful place to give birth to a child. I think you'd agree with me. Sort of emblematic for the rest of Jesus' life, isn't it? Shortly after Jesus is born, some wise men come seeking him. They say, where is this king of the Jews? We've seen a star in the east and we've we've come to worship him. They come to the city of Jerusalem, they ask and they inquire. Herod says, well, I don't know. Let me look it up. So he goes to the prophets and those scribes and says, look into the law. When, ah, it's predicted, king, that he's going to be born in Bethlehem. So he goes back to the, to the wise men and he says, he's going to be in Bethlehem. And I tell you what, when you're finished there, you let me know. I want to go and pay him tribute myself. See this little guy. But of course, that really wasn't what he wanted to do, is it? The scripture says that when the, 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 the wise men, the magi, came to Herod, he was terrified when they told him that a king of the Jews had been born. 
So Herod's real plan was to exterminate Jesus, to kill him, to put him to death. God told the wise men to return by another way, so they don't go back to Herod. He's enraged when he learns that they've, they haven't returned to him. And sort of in, sp- in desperation and in spite, he decrees that all boys that were born within two years of when the wise men had come to them should be put to death, thinking that that would get rid of his problem. And yet we know that Jesus, that, that Jesus was safe because God had told Mary and Joseph to flee to Egypt. And so shortly after Jesus is born, we have a little guy that was sought to be put to death, and now he's with his mother and father living as a, as a refugee in Egypt. Egypt's a strange thing to think about, the very place that, that God had saved his people and brought his people out of many years before. And this isn't the end of the strife in Jesus' life. What happened later in life? Well, we don't really know. The Bible doesn't give us too many details about his childhood. We do know that he took up the profession of presumably his his adopted earthly father, Joseph, and was a carpenter. And we also have reason to think that Joseph wasn't alive by the time Jesus was starting his ministry because we don't hear anything about him. And so we don't know much about Jesus' upbringing, but we do know that he probably experienced the loss of his earthly father at a fairly young age. And what happens after that? What happens after Jesus starts his earthly ministry? Well, the Gospels narrate that in great detail. You'd be hard-pressed to read through Matthew, Mark, or Luke, or John, and to come through them and at the other end think that Jesus lived a peaceful life. In fact, it would seem that the animosity and the hostility of Herod for Jesus as a baby was emblematic of everything that was to come. Jesus was constantly at odds with the religious leaders, wasn't he? They hated him. They mocked him. They accused him of all sorts of things that he didn't do. They accused him of being satanic. And remember, these guys weren't just on the periphery. These guys were not grouchy, cranky men trying to gaslight you from a keyboard a thousand miles away. These guys were with Jesus in the temple. These men, his enemies, were walking amidst the crowd as Jesus would walk and teach throughout Jerusalem and on the roads outside. Few of us are called to live a life where the things we say and the things we do are scrutinized and turned over and examined like Jesus. Where everything we say is examined to see if anything can be exploited and used against us. The few who do have these sorts of experiences often retreat to private lives anytime they can because they know how excruciating and painful and hard that sort of life is. But Jesus didn't even retreat. Day to day, he spent with the people. Any time they wanted him, he was there. Yes, at points he would go away and be with his disciples, and yet we see even in his example of when they come after him, he never turns them away. He's right there with the people, and he's right there with his accusers, his enemies, those that are seeking to pin him on his own words and actions. Where is the peace in that? Where is it? Of course, we'd like to think that everything was better at home, that with his homies, you know, the 12, everything was cool, no issues, smooth sailing. Yet we know that that's not true either. How many times did they fail to understand the things that Jesus said? And as a father, I was thinking about this. How often do I get my peace robbed from me just by the very fact of the children whom I love failing to understand me? You know, I was out on a project just a couple of weeks ago, and I, the times I was most frustrated, it was only because there was a disconnect between what I was saying and trying to achieve and what my helpers, my boys, thought I wanted 
them to do. How many times did Jesus say, do you still not understand? Do you still not understand? Are you slow to remember the things that have been said and prophesied? And of course, then again, you have the infighting amongst the disciples, the comparisons that popped up from time to time, just like we may experience with children in our own home. And of course, even those that were closest to him, most precious to him, weren't always there for him. They weren't always dependable. Eventually, Jesus is going to be betrayed by one of his disciples. The Pharisees lie about him. They're going to concoct a plan to have him put to death. The Jewish people are going to turn against him. And in the end, they're going to exchange his life for the life of a notorious criminal named Barabbas. Jesus is going to be publicly humiliated, mocked, whipped, scorned, hung up on a cross, ultimately forsaken, not just by the disciples, but in the moment of his death when he took the sins of you and and me upon him, forsaken by his father as well. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus' end in death is desertion and suffering. What peace is there in that? Isaiah would say in another place, he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Is this really the Prince of Peace? Sure doesn't look like him. Looking at his life, looking at the peace that he offers, I wonder if any of us want a part of his peace. But to think in this way, with this logic, with this rationale, is to think in the exact same way that the Jews of Jesus' day thought. It's to make the same tragic mistake about Jesus that they did. You see, they were looking for Jesus to bring peace, but of a sort that fell far short of what they needed. They were like a man suffering under a terminal condition, who when he saw the doctor kept demanding that the doctor prescribe all sorts of painkillers. The doctor is wise and knew that the severity of the condition would would claim the life if a treatment was not insisted upon and moved towards, but his patient would not have it. The man demanded Percocets from his doctor. And when the doctor would not provide those for him, the sick man wanted nothing to do with him. He drove him away. This is the way the Jews approached Jesus. Jesus was their prince of peace. He came offering peace to them, but they did not want his peace. They rejected him and therefore rejected his peace. You may remember before Jesus would go to the cross, he would look out over Jerusalem and say, while crying and weeping bitterly, oh, if you had known this day, even you, Jerusalem, the things which make for peace. But now it's been hidden from you. Looking at Jesus' life, you might be tempted to ask, what does he know about peace? What does he know? The title doesn't seem fitting, does it? And yet he says to you, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. What is the peace that Jesus is the prince of? What is the peace that he offers to you? Jesus did not have peace with everyone around him, did he? He didn't have peace with nature either. He was hungry. He faced storms in a boat. He died a physical death. And yet we know that he is the Prince of Peace. I think that when many of us think about peace, those conflicts, those hardships, those sufferings are the things that we want to be taken from us. Those are the things we want removed from our lives. And while that desire isn't wrong, we know that Jesus has a peace that transcends our conflicts on earth. His peace is not the absence of conflict or tragedy or hardship, 
but it is the absolute assurance of God's good purpose through it. That is Jesus' peace. It is not the taking away of all hardships in this life, in the life to come, yes and amen. But here and now, no, soon and very soon, right? His peace is the knowledge of God's and assurance of God's good purpose in all that is said and done. It's the knowledge that God who loves us is good and does good, as Psalm 119 says. It's the peace that is woven through so many of the psalms on the tongue of David as he writes passionately about the hardships and the trials and the oppressions and the the things that are set against him by his enemies. And yet, time and time again, rejoicing in the security of God, the God who is his refuge, his shield, his support, the one who loves him and knows him more intimately than he knows himself. The peace of God is the peace that caused Paul and Silas to sing while imprisoned. It's the peace of God that has allowed Christian men and women throughout the centuries to sing praise to God, even as they go through horrible trials in martyrdom. It's the peace of God that can cause you to be free from anxiety and fear in the midst of uncertainties and even tragedies. Many of us believe that if we would have this kind of peace, we would have this kind of peace if it weren't for our circumstances. But if Jesus is the Prince of Peace, then he offers a solution that satisfies not just part of our problem, not just symptoms of our problem, but that reaches to the very heart, the very root of our problem, and heals it. He isn't seeking to provide painkillers for your pain. He isn't seeking to try to take the edge off. He's given his life for you. He heals what is terminal. And therefore, we need to ask ourselves, what is the root of the matter that causes our lack of peace in all these various earthly circumstances? What is the cause of warfare between nations and offense between brothers? What is the cause of our work being toilsome and hard? What is the cause of people feeling like they're even strangers in their own skin? Peace, a lack of peace even internally that we can't understand or rationalize. What is the cause of sickness and death? What is it that causes those, those things? What is the heart of all these conflicts, the root of all of our lack of peace? The world lacks peace with God who is holy, holy, holy. Mankind, that we are all a part of, born into by nature, has been at odds with God since the fall. And as a result of lacking peace with God, many lesser things bring us turmoil. Without peace with God, many things cause us to be afraid. Without peace with God, we should live in fear of broken relationships and a lack of financial security and sickness and death because if we don't have peace with God, then this is the very best there is. It all goes downhill from here without peace with God. What the Prince of Peace offers you, what he says it's yours this morning, is peace with God. His peace surpasses understanding. His peace is far beyond our, compre- our ability to comprehend. It is the precious peace that Jesus had to lay down when he was forsaken for our sake, when the wrath of God was poured out on him. In his death, he gave up the perfect peace and love and union that he had with God so that you might have it so that it might change your life from the very foundation all the way up. Peace with God. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with our Lord Jesus Christ. With God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the peace that Jesus offers to you. Do you want it? 
And I ask you that. Do you want his peace with everything that comes along with it? Do you want his peace? If you do, it's yours. It's yours. Jesus offers you the peace that he has with his Father. He offers you the peace of the perfect love that exists between the Trinity from all eternity into all eternity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That peace, that union, that harmony, that settledness is yours. On Christmas, we remember Jesus coming to earth as a baby, born in a manger, born into a sinful world, a selfless, a a world filled with selfishness, turmoil, pain, suffering. He was born, and he bore all of that as God so that he might give to you his peace. In fact, he went even further than that. Again, I want to underline the fact that he went further than that, and God made Christ, who was sinless, who was perfect, to become sin on your and my behalf, so that we might have the righteousness of God in him and therefore peace with God. If you are a Christian, Jesus is your Prince of Peace. The title isn't just some sweet, cute ideal. It's a life-changing, powerful reality. The peace that he gives you is not hypothetical. Though it's peace with God who is spiritual, we, we don't see God. And though it's a peace that's foundation is laid in eternity, it transcends the chasm between heaven and earth. Yes, in heaven there will be perfect peace. But here, amidst all of our earthly circumstances, the good and the bad, the times of joy and laughing and celebration, and the times of sorrow and mourning, his peace transcends and is there and changes our lives. There is not one earthly affliction or joy where his peace cannot and should not be felt by his child. Jesus' life had tribulations. Not trying to hide that. The Bible doesn't hide that. Jesus' life had hardships. And you will share in them if you share in Christ, but through them, Jesus promised to you is that you will have his peace. Jesus has already given it to you. Jesus is our peace, so if we are in Christ, he has given it. Like Esau's birthright, if you're a child of God, he's given it to you. To the extent that we recognize that we have peace with God, the trying and the difficult and the painful circumstances of life shrivel in size and become, as the Apostle Paul says, light momentary afflictions. There is a correlation between our recognition and our living with and our calling out for and enjoying the peace of Christ and the demagnification of all of our problems. I'm not denying problems. The Apostle Paul isn't one to hide his hardships. He tells us of all of them. And then he says, I consider these things but light and momentary afflictions. In this life, there will be difficulty, but Jesus offers and gives peace in the life to come and in this life. But I want to be clear on one thing. The peace that Jesus offers is not just metaphysical peace that kicks in once we die. It is a peace for you here and now. While we don't have the guarantee that we will have peace with all of mankind, we're told to strive to be at peace, While we don't have total peace with nature, there are still sickness and there's still hurricanes that come our way. Our peace with God affects and frames in all of these trials. Our peace with God is the frame to be placed over all of these things so that they will not and cannot consume us. It gives us foundation to stand upon so that we can weather those conflicts by faith. Back to the analogy of the sick man. Instead of that man, imagine a man who is sick and dying, terminal condition, and yet, miracle of miracles, he had been promised by his doctor, guaranteed that there was something that could make him well. That in just a few short months, he would be well. 
he would be whole. Along the way, the doctor said that the treatment can be a little rough. There can be some pain, some hardships, some inconveniences, some irritations. But three months, his healing would be guaranteed. What effect do you think that that guaranteed healing had on the painful side effects along the way in that man? What do you think it did in him? How do you think it changed his attitude regarding those little irritations that he had to undergo? This is what Paul speaks of when he says our pains and trials he considers light and momentary afflictions for the glory of God. Jesus came as the Prince of Peace to heal the very heart of our problem. He offers you peace with God. And if you have peace with your maker and sustainer and your judge, if you've secured his love and his affection, what is there that can rob you of that peace? Jesus has delivered to you the most robust, sturdy, all-consuming peace you could dream of. Actually, like we already said, we, we don't understand how great it is. That's why God says that it's peace beyond all comprehension, peace beyond our rational ability to conceive and understand why. It doesn't make sense at times. It's the reason, you know, our, our dear brother Zach could call me last night and in the same conversation tell me that his dad had passed away and yet tell me in a follow-up statement that, praise God, it is well with my soul. If Jesus is your Savior, then he's given his peace to you. So live in it. You have peace with God. He loves you. He supports you. He provides for you. He will not let anything happen to you unless it is for your good. And that's a very hard thing to understand at points. And therein is where we find peace that's beyond all understanding. Live in his peace. In every circumstance, peace is given to you by Jesus. He is the Prince of Peace. And so, here is what you're to do. Let the peace of Christ rule your hearts. That is what Paul says. Let the peace of Christ rule your hearts. It's been given to you. Let it rule your hearts and be thankful. Do not sell the birthright of your peace because you're hungry or because you're going through hardship. It's been given to you. It's a birthright of being a son of God. Peace with the Father. The peace is yours through Jesus. Do not give it up. If you're here this morning and I want to say, if you don't know what Jesus' peace is, if you can relate to all the hardships I've been talking about, but you have no idea what I mean when I talk about peace, joy, happiness, especially in trouble, what's wrong with that guy? If you don't understand what I've been saying, I want to tell you that Jesus says his peace can be yours as well. Christmas is a time where we all give, give gifts, but Christmas is really not about giving gifts. Our giving of gifts is a very small reflection of the great gift that Jesus gave to us. We love because he first loved us. We give because he first gave to us. And what did he give to us? He gives us his love, his peace, and he offers it to you. Jesus died so that you might have peace with God. It was very costly. It was very expensive. But he's happy to do it. He wants you to have his peace. So, if you don't have peace with God but want it, embrace Jesus Christ. Commit your life to loving and obeying him, and you will have his peace. I want to close by reading there. My Nana, before she died, I, I, I loved this hymn. She had a favorite hymn called Like a River Glorious, and I was thinking about the words of that song as I was uh, preparing to speak this morning, and I wanted to close just by reading it to us. It says this, Like a river glorious is God's perfect peace, over all victorious in its bright increase. Perfect, yet it floweth fuller every day. It's perfect, yet it continues to flow deeper and fuller. Perfect, yet it groweth deeper all the way. Stayed upon Jehovah, settled on Christ. Our hearts are fully blessed, finding as he promised, perfect peace and rest. 
Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and today he gives it to you. Let's pray.